Good afternoon. This is Janice Regal. I'm the president of the National Society of Descendants of and great uh, privilege to bring to you Lynn Turner, uh, who is with uh, the Family Search in Salt Lake City, Utah. And with that, I'm going to let Renee talk a little bit more about him. And my alarm is going off. I'll need to sign in to the Zoom. Hello, everyone. You, we, want to, okay. we want to thank you for joining with us today. This is a very exciting day for any of us that do any sort of genealogical research and um, hunting our ancestors. Uh, Mr. Turner, thank you so much for your willingness to join with us today. And we are so looking forward to learning more about Family Search and the proper ways for us to actually utilize the service that you have been offering to everyone and um, the fact that it's it's free. And that is a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, special privilege that you offer to all of us. And we appreciate that. So, sir, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you. Well, thank you for for that introduction, and and thank you for uh, those of you that were that were able to introduce yourselves. I I found myself um, making some connections, whether it's an ancestor that that was uh, or ancestors from Georgia, or being recently in Richmond, Virginia, um, or somewhere in between, right? And and it's really really fun to to come together and, and talk about family history and genealogy. Um, today, I I, uh, I want to talk about the the family search library and uh, give you an overview of family search. A lot of people don't know the background of family search and uh, the background of the library. And then I'm going to show you a, a couple of um, couple of places right to to come and and, and utilize our resources. Um, unfortunately, in an hour, I probably could just scratch the surface of how to use the website and how to take advantage of the different services that we have in the library, whether you're in Maryland or in Knoxville, Tennessee, or wherever you might be. Um, and so I hope this introduction is of interest, um, starts you thinking of, of different ways that you can kickstart uh, maybe that dead end um, line that you're working on or uh, that line that you just been um, ignoring for a long time, which is my line in Georgia. So um, don't tell my mom, she get a little upset about that. But to start off with, uh, I want to I want to start with the video. And this video is from Roots Tech um, a couple of years ago. As many of you know, uh, we are uh, sponsors of the Roots Tech Conference every year that takes place in Salt Lake City. Uh, had during COVID uh, was online and now it's online and in Salt Lake City. Um, but I think this, uh, this, this little video captures kind of uh, the main message that I, I wanna share today. So uh, I should you should have some sound and if not, you'll see some great images. Got to click on the right slide here.
I hope as as you watch that, you feel the emotion behind it, the emotion of connection. And as we connect with one another, uh, as we connect with our children, our grandchildren, our ancestors, that we're part of something bigger. Um, one of our, our leaders uh, here in, in the LDS church uh, shared the following quote, which I, I, I love. He said, connecting with our ancestors can change our lives in surprising ways. From their trials and accomplishments, excuse me, we gain faith and strength. From their love and sacrifices, we learn to forgive and, and move forward. Our, our children become resilient. We gain protection and power. Ties with ancestors increase, increase family closeness, gratitude, and miracles. Um, and if you haven't felt that in your own uh, family history, I, I invite you to, to, to think about that. Think of the stories, uh, your story that you could share with your children, your grandchildren, um, and that story that you want to leave for your, um, um, your, your descendants, uh, and however many generations that might be. Um, and it just, the, the I look at this, I get emotional when I read it because of the strength, the faith, the just the the examples of toughness uh, that that I have discovered in my own family history. Um, so I want to share one uh, just a quick story from uh, my own family. This is my brother and his wife and his two kids. Um, he he uh, I lost a bet, so I I told him I'd put him in a presentation. Um, so. <laughs> I always tease him that I'm I'm more handsome, but he always reminds me that he is younger. Uh, but this is my younger brother Brady. Love him to death, uh, and he is uh, taking a selfie here with uh, with his family in uh, Turnerville, Wyoming, where my ancestors settled as uh, they came from England to Utah and from Utah to Wyoming. Uh, the picture on my right, hopefully it's on your right as well, is of the original homestead of William Alonzo Turner in, in Turnerville, uh, Wyoming, uh, where he settled in 1890. The house was built a few years after that. Um, but this is his house, his home, excuse me. In the background, it's really hard to see. It's a, this is like a copy of a copy of a copy of a photo. <laughs> But in the in the background, you'll see a big sawmill, and uh, that's kind of my. Uh, in addition to all the farming that, that's going on, the sawmill was also a big part of the Turner for a few generations. One connection, and the reason I share this this particular story is we're talking about connection, is um, on this property today there are still apple trees from my great great grandfather, um, and my cousin. Uh, makes pens out of these apple trees. And this is a pen that I have uh, here in my office of one, uh, a limb of one of those apple trees. And as I take notes, as I take notes for, at work, right, and all the administration, administrative stuff that I get to do, but also the notes of my family history, I remember my, uh, my connection with my ancestor. So let's talk a little bit about family search. Um, and as I get into this, I'm just uh, I invite you if you're in a spot and you have a question, please put it in the chat. I'm sure Renee or someone will keep track of those for me. Um, but uh, and if I I have I have uh, the chat open, I'll try to answer answer them as I go. Um, if it's going to take a little bit too long, I will just I reserve I have some time reserved at the end that I'll answer those questions. But if I miss one, Renee, please. Please keep me honest. So Family Search was originally organized in 1894 under the name of the Society, the Genealogical Society of Utah. It uh, was uh, the uh, it was just a small room. The collection was actually 300 books donated. I have a picture of the outside of this room um, in, in a couple slides here. But uh, this is this is the original Genealogical Society of Utah or Family Search. Uh, the family histories that we had in the collection were just that. It was in the time period when uh, a lot of people were were writing family histories. They were documenting where they came from, 
And uh, we were lucky enough to have a nice little collection to start with. Uh, for those of you that are members of the DAR, I was just meeting with the, the uh, President General a couple of weeks ago, and she always reminds me, I say always, I've met with her a couple of times, but the two times that I have met with her, she does remind me that they're four years older than we are. Uh, but it is during this time period, right, in the early, uh, or excuse me, the late 1800s, early 1900s, where this uh, big movement around family history and Un, uh, discovering and knowing where our ancestors are from uh, really came to be. In 1938, we started microfilming records. Some of you, um, as I'm looking at some of your pictures, may remember my, the microfilm days. Um, I came onto the scene right as microfilm was phasing out. However, I did spend many a night in the Family Search Library and in my local Family Search Center scouring through microfilms uh, to uh, to finish uh, homework assignments at Brigham Young University and also to discover discover my ancestors. In 1938, though, is when we started. And to date, we now have about two and a half million rolls of microfilm. Um, and, and so I'm going to talk about how many images that equals here in just a minute. Um, but uh, ever since about the turn of, of the century, uh, I know this says 2004, but just right around 2000, we actually started uh, testing and play around and playing around with digital capture and digital cameras. 2004 is when we really started phasing out our microfilm cameras and switching to digital. And today we we now have um, this is an old picture of of a map that, that kind of illustrates that this is a global effort that Family Search is involved in. And some of you may have ancestors and so, from some of these uh, countries that are in blue. Some of you may wish that your country was blue, <laughs> um, but we have about 350 different uh, camera operations around the world uh, that look very similar to the to the image that you see here, uh, where they are capturing historical records. And as I mentioned, this is this this picture is a little bit old. Uh, as you can see, right in the middle of this map, we have the country of Ukraine, and many of you know, all of you know, of uh, what's going on right now in Ukraine. Um, and uh, we had made a wonderful connection with the National Archivists in one of our uh, recent Roots Tech uh, events. And because of the war with Russia, we now have about 40 cameras in the Ukraine uh, actively capturing and preserving their heritage. Um, so it's, it's uh, an amazing thing to be a part of and, and to see uh, across the world. Um, and if we don't have your your uh, images and records, we might have them sooner than later. <laughs> um, so what I mentioned, we have two um, two and a half million rolls of microfilm. If you uh, if you all you've all seen this is an example of a microfilm, right? And this only has uh, forty two images. This is just a, a screenshot of of a census in the nineteen hundreds. But on a microfilm, any given microfilm, we've averaged it out over two and a half million rolls of film to be about 11 to 1200 images or pictures on a microfilm. And so when you scan all those, plus all the digital capture that we have going on, we have about 13 billion searchable names because they've been indexed and over 5 billion digital images available for you to discover, gather and connect with your ancestors. Um, and again, this is uh, an a, a active um, endeavor that we're involved in, and uh, we, uh, have we have records, records from a lot, lot of different places. places. And I'm and getting I'm just a little, a little bit, bit of feedback, feedback, if you wouldn't mind muting, making, making sure that you're sure. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, we uh, have records from corners of the world, such as South Africa. I just grabbed an image here. Uh, we have different types of records. Oftentimes, you know, I'll talk with a neighbor or a friend or my wife who rolls her eyes or about family history anytime I mention it. Um, I wish she would thank me from time to time, right, for doing all her family history. But uh, she just typically rolls her eyes when I when I <laughs> mention the term family history. And uh, um, they, they all associate family history and genealogy with census records, right? Census records, census records, census records. There's a lot of different types of records. This is a World War, World War One draft registration card of my great-grandfather, excuse me, my grandfather, 
Um, and again, uh, there's lots of different types of records. I pulled this one out just for this, this class or this presentation because of your association with farmers, right? Uh, if you look real closely, and it's probably kind of hard to read, but it says he's a farmer on his father's ranch. And um, I'm proud of, of my heritage of farmers and as, as well as you are, and those that had uh, uh, occupations associated with farming. It's such a great, um, uh, great thing and a great uh, foundation for our country. Um, we do get a question a lot of the times of, well, this is great that you're capturing all these historical records. Well, what about places such as Africa or Oceania, where there aren't a lot of written records? So Family Search is actively gathering uh, oral genealogies. We did start in the 1960s and 1970s in Polynesia. Uh, in fact, um, a, a few months ago, it's been probably several months, but a few months ago, um, we hosted the Prime Minister of Tonga to the at the library, and we were uh, discussing uh, different records that we had for Tonga and, and what Family Search is and what we're all about. And one of my staff members had actually found the oral the genealogy, the the interview that his grandmother had uh, had given us in the early 1970s. And it was the first time it, he had heard his grandmother's voice in a really, really long time. Um, and you can imagine the emotions that uh, that came from that interaction. Right now, um, uh, our main focus on oral genealogies is in on the continent of Africa. We're in these different countries. We have a million, uh, we, we have just crossed a million interviews um, of village elders. Um, the the quote which I always get wrong is when the village elder elder dies, so does the history of the place or the family uh, dies with him or her. And so we are uh, feverishly working towards capturing as much of that uh, that oral tradition and that or uh, that memory that uh, living memory that is basically a walking encyclopedia. Um, in these million interviews, we've actually captured over 200 million names. Uh, so an interviewee or an interviewer, excuse me, will go to an uh, to a uh, to a village. They will record. They will ask interview questions. They will ask them to recite uh, as much as the genealogy of the of the village and the, and, and the families within that village as they can, and then they bring that back to one of our uh, meeting houses, our, our church meeting houses in 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 country where they then extract that information into a family tree, which is then published on familysearch.org. Uh, so yes, it's a big effort and one that uh, we um, are very, very uh, proud of to be able to be part of and, and help capture this uh, wonderful resource that, that hopefully will be a resource for many generations to come. Um, on Family Search, as you guys know, uh, you can build your family tree, right? And again, this is just a screenshot that uh, we have over a billion and a half people in our family tree. Uh, so we encourage people to come. And, and it's one of the very first places that we start with people is right on Family Tree. You know, let's kick off a search. Let's see what we can find and see what others have done. And I then obviously make sure that it's accurate and, and well sourced and documented, right? Um, but it's amazing when people come into the family family search library in Salt Lake. Uh, they maybe have maybe they're there not even to do family history or genealogy, but someone said, "Hey, you got to go check out the library." They come in, they create an account, and within after they enter a few generations, it kicks off uh, a, a great uh, family tree for them of uh, several generations where a cousin has done a lot of research or. Um, uh, a project where we have uh, been working to build, help build community trees. Um, as you guys also know and, um, uh, and should know, shame, shame if you don't, just kidding, but uh, we, uh, each ancestor has their own individual page and this is a place also to preserve stories. Um, the, again, this is of uh, my great, great grandfather, William Alonzo Turner, um, I wrote a, a history, I believe, I don't know if I got the screenshot of it, it's okay, but I wrote a history of him and his father and their journey from England to, uh, to Utah 
and what that entailed. And one thing that I learned during that uh, during that research process, I learned a lot of things, don't get me wrong, but uh, one of the things that really jumped out at me is when they arrived in St. Louis up the Mississippi River and arrived in St. Louis and bought a wagon and two oxen to cross the plains that many in their company had never driven a wagon. And, and if you can just imagine the scene, right, of all these people going west, whether it was to Utah or to Oklahoma or even further, right, to California, and many of them may not even have owned uh, a wagon or oxen and didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> and I wish I could have been a fly in the wall to see that happen, but the resiliency and the effort that 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 that, that went into that would have been um uh, in, well, not would have been, it is inspiring to me to know that I can do hard things too, right? And I can do th things that are challenging. And and that, again, going, going back to the quote, that's that resiliency. That's the connection that we can have and the, the strength that we can draw from our ancestors. I love this quote as well. This is from uh, a, um, a doctor in, uh, I, I think he's a doctor in nursing, but um, she said uh, this about the power of family stories. She says, knowing one's family stories creates meaning that goes beyond the individual to provide a sense of self through time and in relation to family. This expanded sense of self provides a larger context for understanding and dealing with life's experiences and challenges. This connection across generation appears to contribute to the resilience at all stages of life. Um, and I I, uh, I love that. I love that. Uh, uh, that message. And um, I just, uh, I'm going to invite you to share your story as we finish up uh, today uh, that, you know, what is your story and are you sharing that story with others? Um, as you know, family search is free. Uh, we, uh, we also have a mobile app that you can use and uh, someone put this in here free. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> We want you to come take advantage of the resources that we have and also contribute uh, to, to our family tree if you can and if you desire. Uh, but if you don't and you just want to come and take advantage of the wonderful resources that we have, then, then you are more than welcome to do that. So let's shift gears just a little bit and let's talk about the library and why, uh, why I believe and many believe that uh, it is the premier destination uh, for genealogists. Uh, I love this quote. Um, this was this came off a of TripAdvisor. I, I regularly um, review Google reviews, TripAdvisor. We don't serve food, so I don't look at Yelp. But we have a, def a, a handful of different ways that we receive uh, email and and other different ways that we receive feedback because we're always looking for ways to improve, right? Um, but I love this quote. Um, this person said, perhaps you have visited a little family search center at a nearby LDS church in your neighborhood. They are very helpful, but if you want the full experience, you must come to the family search library in Salt Lake City. Here you will find troves of microfilms, scores of computers, and both professional and volunteer staff to help you in your, in your quest. The staff is a gold mine. Be warned. It is easy to spend your entire day here or several days if you've really got the bug. If you're if you're any level of genealogist, novice to professional, this is a wonderful and hugely worthwhile addition to your bucket list. Um, I have had to remind people <laughs> that, that they only had 45 minutes before they needed to get to the airport <laughs> or they were going to miss their flight. <laughs> Right. Um, as you as you come to Salt Lake and as you take advantage of the resources online, right, whether it's in the, for library resources or family search in general, um, it's easy to get lost. Um, I, I imagine many of you have uh, been sleuthing through family search and, you know, trying to find that that long lost ancestor. And, uh, you know, you're, you're maybe sitting in front of the TV while you're doing it. Maybe you're in your office. And the next thing you know, it's one o'clock in the morning and you've lost complete track of time. Maybe you've even forgotten to eat. <laughs> right. But that is that that is family history. That's genealogy. And that's the joy in this journey. Um, though the I do get a question often of why should I come to the library? And I'm going to answer that here because a lot of people, and hopefully none of you on this call today, 
think this because it's heresy, <laughs> but not everything is online. And if we're going to be, uh, if we're going to do exhaustive research, we need to make sure that we are taking advantage of all the resources out there, not just the ones that are online. So um, I, I mentioned that I did have a, a, a photo of the outside of the original library. Um, again, this it's not the entire house that you see here. It's just the it's the upper room of the historian's office. And uh, if you didn't notice it before, I, I think I showed this this picture before. If you see the lady in the middle in the back, um, in my experience, um, and this is no offense to women, but women aren't very tall many times, right? <laughs> I, I imagine she's probably five feet tall or so. And if you look at the wall, that that roof, that that ceiling is not very tall. And as a I'm six two and I'm always hitting my head on something. Um, and I imagine in this library, it, I would have quickly uh, outgrown it and been very upset, uh, always banging my head against the wall, which I always do in the proverbial wall, right? But uh, always banging my head on the ceiling or the wall of this library. So as you can imagine, with all that microfilm acquisition, all the books that we've acquired over time, we had to relocate. Uh, so we are currently uh, in downtown Salt Lake City. It's uh, on West Temple. I believe it's 35 West Temple, if I'm not mistaken. I should probably look at my business card one of these days. Um, but uh, we are now in, in this library. I noticed that someone said decades ago, um, or a long time ago, you had made a trip to Salt Lake. It is completely changed. And, and, and so I'm going to show you how it's changed. But the building is 144,000 square feet across five different floors. Um, and, it, and now we have uh, collections of all kinds, right? We have, um, as I mentioned, over two and a half million rolls of microfilm. Not all of them are in the library, but about a million and a half of them are. Uh, we have about 600,000 microfiche, which are these microfiche cards. And we also have uh, around 16,000, between 16 and 17,000 uh, maps and oversized pedigrees. Um, so I did, I mentioned the visit from Prime Minister of Tonga. Uh, not too long after his visit, the Queen of Tonga came and um, we were able to pull out a big oversized pedigree chart that someone had put together a long, long time ago. And she was able to find her mother in, in that pedigree chart and uh, link uh, with generations that were all the way back to 900 AD. Uh, it was pretty cool and pretty, uh, pretty amazing to see that connection and, um, and what it meant to her. Um, we also, I'm going to talk about digital stuff here in just a minute, but we also have many resources for users in the library to use as well. Um, again, all of which are free to use. So I want to, I want to just take you through a couple of the different floors here in the library um, to give you a sense of how it's changed and um, just kind of talk about the different resources that we have. Um, I'm going to hop back well, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll talk about it here in a minute. I talked about how many number of microfilm we had, but not how many books, which is one of the main reasons I encourage people to come to the library. Um, but as you come into the the library in Salt Lake City, you come to the main floor, and a lot of the times we get the question of, um, "What is this place?" Uh, it said Family Search Library on the outside of the building. This doesn't look like a library, and that's by design. Uh, we are looking at ways to engage more people in family history. And if you have children or grandchildren that are in their teens, um, my case, I have a, a almost 14 year old and, um, and a seven year old, and uh, they don't really want to talk about history with dad. Um, I think they think I'm boring, which is OK. Um, at least they don't hate me yet. Um, but uh, your children, your grandchildren may want to learn more about their family history, but the last thing that I would encourage you to do is open up a pedigree chart or even a scrapbook and show them photos and charts and pedigrees and stuff, right? So that's what this floor is designed to do is to engage a younger audience in, in allow them to interact with their family history in different ways. And so you'll see some big monitors here where they can uh, uh, play around with the monitor, like a big iPad, if you will. They can find photos. Uh, and different memories of ancestors. 
Um, they can uh, learn in different countries where their ancestors were from and all in, a, in an interactive environment. Um, and we actually have, uh, I had a, another quote that I, I didn't include in this one, but um, uh, another online uh, Google review said, you know, this place is amazing when you have when when you have to make your way through 250 young people to get to where you want to be. <laughs> right. So uh, usually on Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursday evenings, when we're open till 8 p.m., we'll have uh, local church youth groups come and, and and discover more about their family history. And oftentimes we'll have two, three, four, five hundred 500 people come in on an evening just to participate just on this floor. Um, the floor has more than just those different uh, interactive oh, activities. We try to make the experience better for our, our we, we refer to you as, as, as our guests, our visitors. Um, we, we have expanded our, our uh, break room. Um, I don't know who takes a break when you're doing family history, but if you want one, you can take a break. Uh, we've also updated all of our bathrooms throughout the the library, and so that's that's a not necessarily a reason to come. But <laughs> we uh, since 1985, they needed a, a facelift, and so they 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 got one. Um, a lot of different changes happening. This is on our third floor, and I mentioned that uh, 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 we have more than 300 uh, books now in our collection. We now have in the building, we have about 610,000 books. About half of the collection is for the U.S. and Canada. The other half of the collection, which I'll show you here in a second, is for other inter, uh, international areas. Um, and the, uh, it also includes the largest family history um, collection in the world. Um, uh, different uh, some of those being published through professional companies and professional publishers. Others are one-offs that people uh, have published and and uh, designed themselves. And in any time someone wants to donate one or we find one we can purchase, we we purchase them. And so we have somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 50,000 different family histories um, from all around the world for people to, to take advantage of. Um, Again, so uh, this is the U.S. and Canada floor. We have scanners available for people to use. The, these, again, are, for, uh, are free. We have 10 scanners on our U.S. Canada floor. We have about uh, six to eight on our international floor. Um, and this is a, a way to come uh, research in our books. If you find something in a book that you want, here's a scanner. You can scan a few pages, save that to a flash drive, uh, or even email it to yourself, however you want to access that information. Um, we are, um, as I mentioned, everything is free, it's, and that includes the library as well, unless you want a vending machine snack, sorry. <laughs> Our vending services said that you have to pay for those. Um, but uh, we do not charge for photocopy prints. Um, if you come in and, and um, are not prepared, or you left your jump drive in your hotel room, or you left at home, whatever the case may be, we'll give you a jump drive so you can save information too as well. Again, all free of charge and, and making uh, trying to help make this experience the best possible for you. This gives you just a different view of the floor. Um, as you can see, there's plenty of table space for people to, uh, to do research. You'll notice that there aren't as many chairs on these tables in the foreground. And that is because this picture was taken during COVID. And so we were doing uh, uh, six feet uh, dis uh, uh, safe distancing, um, but we now have more chairs. Uh, around those tables, and which are usually filled quite often. Um, on our second floor and our other floors, this is an old picture, and I have never told these ladies that they're part of my presentation, and I'm sure they would kill me if they knew. Um, but uh, this is this is kind of this is the the traditional view as you came off the elevator on our second floor, and it just you know it was dark. It wasn't very inviting. Um, and and we just said, you know, we've we've got to make some changes. So we flipped the lights on. We've um, changed microfilm microfilm readers out for uh, digital microfilm readers, uh, and and it's just it's made a huge difference. The 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 feeling and the the excitement in in the library is completely different. Walking into a lighted room instead of a dark room, um, and so. Uh, as you can imagine, this this again is, is is filled quite a bit. 
Uh, on this floor also, we have this family archive space uh, that used to look like this. This was mid construction. And so it kind of looks half, I would say not even half done, but you, it kind of looks a little messy. <laughs> uh, but now we have uh, what we refer to as our memory lane. Um, and our uh, search engine optimizers told us that that was not a good term. So we also put the, the subtitle of the Family Memories Preservation Center as the title. But we affectionately refer to this as our memory, memory lane. This is a place where people can come and convert uh, uh, photos, slides, um, analog video, audio cassettes, all to digital. And so here are some of the different uh, pictures of different equipment that we have in this space. And this is what it looks like today. Um, you, you can reserve this room. You can uh, you can research together. You can uh, reminisce and tell stories about different memories that uh, you might have as a family. Uh, recently, we had the Orange County, uh, California Genealogical Society in Salt Lake City. And uh, a mother and daughter are members of that society. And they came together. And uh, mom was researching in our books and, and other areas of our library. And the daughter spent the entire week here in memory lane, digitizing a suitcase full of memories uh, that the family had. And that was, uh, that was pretty fun, pretty special and a good opportunity to, to uh, get to know them on, on a different level. Right. And, and understand that society needs uh, society, different societies have different needs. And, and we're here to, to try to meet as many as we can. Um, so as I mentioned, the building is five floors. They got the main floor, it's ground level. And you have the two floors uh, that I just talked about are above ground. And then we have two below ground and we refer to them as B1 and B2. B1 is, uh, B1 and B2 are really our international floors uh, and also where we have our fiche collection and global map collection. So if you have physical maps for across the world, whether it's US, Canada or China, it's it's here on B1. And so we co-located those. Uh, we uh, bought new map cabinets and the other ones were getting kind of hard to open and close. And uh, we also uh, uh, installed new computer stations in, in this place, in, in this floor as well. You'll notice on, on the, this picture here with the computer workstations, um, I, I failed to mention this on the last one, but all of these computer stations have two, uh, uh, all computer stations that we have and offer to guests have two or three monitors. And also all of these uh, desks are height adjustable. So they are ADA compliant and compatible. So if you're in a wheelchair and you need a little bit lower or need a little bit higher, you can do that. Um, sometimes I get tired of sitting all day. And so if you want to stand and do your research, you can, you can raise that desk to standing level and, and stand and stretch your legs a little bit as you research as well. Cause who wants to leave right while you're in the middle of that hunt? Um, so, uh, we have 375 workstations, uh, all of them, um, are, uh, available to use for, uh, any of our visitors. Uh, this is the B2 floor. This is where our international book collection is. I got just a quick little snapshot of it to the off to the side. Uh, but in the far end, you will see some ladders back there behind a wall. Uh, this is an early photo and I need and I need to update it. Uh, but this is uh, this is where our scanning center is. This is the main purpose of this scanning center is to scan the books from the Family Search Library and make them available through our digital library on familysearch.org. Uh, so if you go to Family Search and you click on search, you'll see a drop down menu. One of them is, says books. That's where these books are going um, when we can publish them online. So um, that's uh, copyright law is one of those difficult things that we deal with. And uh, we are in the process of making copyright restricted books available digitally only in the library. So of the 600,000 books that we have in the library and the other half million books that we have in storage that we are still processing, um, there's only a fraction of those that are available online today. Um, and so one of those main reasons to come to the library is to access those things that are not available to you online. Um, uh, hopefully someday they will be. <laughs> um, I'll tell you another reason why to come here in just a moment as well. 
And I want to talk about the li uh, the family search library desktop and the, and associated uh, and web pages. There's two separate things. But every computer in the library has uh, what we refer to as our patron desktop, which looks like this. Um, and this is meant to get you quickly to different resources that you need. So, for example, and another good reason to come to any library and um, ours in particular, and I know other libraries offer different services or different uh, subscription sites, but we will give you quick links to different parts of the world including all those that we do pay for and that are uh, free to our users within the library, such as Newspaper Archive or Newspapers.com, Genealogy Bank, uh, et cetera, et cetera. My Heritage, Find My Past, uh, many, many uh, sites that, that are available. Um, we do have a quick link to Family Search resources. Hopefully, you guys are familiar with the Family Search Wiki. Excuse me. Um, I, I, I shared this particular screenshot because it's our homepage, but also because it, uh, we are now using Google Translate to translate uh, pages into other languages. We can now, uh, it's not the cleanest way, but many people that are uh, familiar and needing other languages are familiar with Google Translate and uh, take it with a grain of salt, but it's pretty good where they can uh, access. We have a lot of great material, for example, in Latin America, but it's in English. And so if they want it in Spanish, they click Spanish and they can get a lot of that uh, material in Spanish to help them in their research um, and or other languages that they might need. One of the uh, other cool things that uh, we offer is this get help option. I know in any library they offer help, but in our library, we're actually gonna bring the help to you. So you click get help on our library desktop and you get presented with uh, some options or you're looking for help in the United States or international research. And, and then it'll ask you a couple more questions. And then we will send the right helper to you. So, for example, Renee might be researching in um, England. And uh, we have a pool of users that are specialists or have expertise in England. So it'll, it'll notify the five helpers that are available or six or how many ever we have for England and say, hey, Renee is sitting at this computer on this floor, um, and then we will assign somebody with that expertise to go to her, um, and which wouldn't be me, Renee, I'm sorry. Um, but it would be somebody that that has that that expertise and that specialty. Um, one, the I mentioned that another reason to, to come to the library is this help. Um, I love this quote that was shared with me about a month ago. Um, by a lady named Sue, and she said that we could we could use this. Um, Mandy Stacy is one of our volunteer helpers, and she says Mandy Stacy was so kind and patient with me as she helped me set up my family tree. She was extremely knowledgeable and helpful. It seemed just as important to her that I find my ancestor ancestor as it was for me. She is obviously invested in each visitor she helps. What a delight! And I think that uh, in, encapsulates. The type of helpers that we have at the library, uh, whether they're volunteer or paid staff, they want to they want to find your ancestor. In some cases, worse than you do. <laughs> but uh, if if it's not more than what uh, the desire that you have to find your ancestor, it's definitely on par. Um, and uh, it, we just we want to. Uh, I've been accused of having uh, too many people, too kind of people in the library. And uh, if we if you come to the library and we're too kind to you, I apologize. We'll try to be a little more um, rude. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. So um, I'm out of time, but I, I want to share a couple of things in closing. So uh, the Family Search Library, we have created a set of pages. The URL is on this screen. It's very simple. It's familysearch.org forward slash library. And I want you to uh, invite you to go to the library web pages and see the different services that we have available. One of the ones that is highly underutilized is our online consultations. So we have staff that part of their job is um, making themselves available during uh, different times of the day. And uh, when someone needs help in Texas and Kentucky, Maryland, uh, Montana, I heard a couple of several different states, right? As you guys were introducing yourselves, uh, 
we we recognize that you can't come to Salt Lake and you might need a little more specialized help than you might be getting at a family search center or your local society or even on your own. And so uh, there you see right down here, it says research help. Let's see where my mouse is. There's a link to research help and it'll give you a couple of different options and a couple of suggestions on, on receiving some of that help. And one of them is the online consultation. So you you again, you can fill out a couple of ask, answer a couple of questions. I want help with England, and I'm only available on Tuesdays uh, uh, in the afternoon. It will match you up with a specialist from England that has availability on Tuesday that afternoon. Um, sometimes, and, and one of our uh, we one of the initial feedback that we get is that a 20 minute consultation isn't enough time. I will guarantee you, 20 minutes is plenty of time for you to get a couple of ideas to continue your, your research. These online consultations aren't designed to do all of your research for you, but to give you those next few steps, maybe bounce some ideas off a specialist um, and, and counsel together and collaborate to see what are some other things, what are some rocks that I haven't uncovered? Where should I look next? I've done these five things. What's the sixth thing I should do? Um, those types of things. We do offer a little bit longer consultations for DNA. If you have a DNA case or DNA research that you're working on, 45 to 60 minutes for those because they are a little bit more complex and they do take a little more time to go through. And so depending on, on the type of uh, situation that you are uh, needing help with, uh, we'll ta tailor that to you uh, the best that we can. So uh, great resources here. They're under learning. There's a there's over 1,200 webinars that you can take advantage of to learn how to use the catalog, how to use FamilySearch.org, how to research in Poland, or how to research in X place. Um, uh, it talks about our collection, how you can better access the collection, and also has our hours of operation, information about parking and all that other good stuff. Um, I encourage uh, your society to be thinking about a possible trip to come out to Salt Lake City. We're happy to give you a, a webinar before you come out, uh, we'll roll out the red carpet, give you a class while you're in town, um, but also give you that specialized one-on-one -on -one help uh, as you come and as you network together and as you connect with one another as a society and as friends, come to the library and allow us to connect with your ancestors, help you connect with your ancestors as well. So come visit the library web pages, get to know us a little bit better. And what uh, there's also an article under visit on how to best prepare for your trip to the library. So a lot of good stuff. So why do we do this? So um, uh, just a, just in closing, um, it again, it's about family connection. And, and whether it's past, present, or future, this is about family connection. So our commitment to helping people connect with their ancestors root, is rooted in our beliefs. Uh, we believe that families are meant to be central to our lives. And because of Jesus Christ, family relationships will continue beyond this life. Uh, we therefore believe that all family members, those living as well as those who lived in the past and those who will live in the future, share an enduring bond that reaches across generations. So with that, again, what is your story? What do you want to share? What is the story of your ancestors that hasn't been told? Uh, I invite you to come and discover that on FamilySearch.org and invite you to Salt Lake. And if you do come to Salt Lake, come visit me. <laughs> Say hi, please. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions? Yes, uh, this is Janice Sue. Thank you so much, Lynn, for uh, being with us. When I met you in California, I believe that you said uh, that when someone came, if there is a book uh, that is in the library that is not digitized, that we could bring it up and your uh, people would digitize it is that correct still um so uh, yes and no there 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 are always little caveats right and and i don't want to give a blanket yes because uh, we can't do scan on demand very easy easily or quickly but uh, we will put it in our scanning queue uh, I, I just uh, and the reason i'm kind of, I'm, I'm not trying to be dodgy just um 
we we want to be helpful, right? I mean, if it's a personal item like a diary or um, something uh, or a journal, we invite you to scan that yourself. If it's a family history that is a, a published one or something like that, then we can definitely put it in our scanning queue. But we we are working with multiple teams within Family Search right now. I just working with our European team on um, a scanning project of over 2,000 books of the fam uh, the German family books that uh, that we have in our collection. And so, and we actually have more than 2,000, but they just want to start with 2,000. So there's different projects like that going on. And so to kind of disrupt that whole production flow, I just want to be careful and I don't overcommit. Uh, but yes, definitely if you have a request or if there's a book that has been scanned and then the physical book has been placed off in offsite storage and, and you can't get it, we'll make sure you get access to it one way or another in Salt Lake. Um, we just need a little advance notice. And again, the library web pages will tell you how to do that. Same with microfilms. So um, we are setting up a process. I actually had a meeting just yesterday where we'll have a process in place where uh, if, a, if a film is restricted and it is not in the library when you come, we will make sure that you have access to it digitally. Thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. yes. Lynn, Thank I, you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, ma'am. This is Renee, Lynn. I'm sorry. Um, I uh, do have one question that has posed through in, in the chat. I wasn't sure if you saw it, but we do have a question that was asked about the uh, the family history centers that are locally. Now I'm gonna share, don't laugh at me when I tell you this, okay, Lynn, but when I give lectures, I talk about mm -hmm. the family search library in Salt Lake as the mothership because we have all these little family history centers around in the communities and I always call those the satellites. So we have a question posed about those, one of like is 20 minutes away what would be kind of the information that they would be able to get at that LDS satellite center uh, that would be closer to their communities? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking the question. And it's a very good analogy, and I avoided it today. But you, <laughs> since you brought it up, I'll bring it up. <laughs> That's kidding. <laughs> um, uh, and the reason I bring it up, it's a little bit of a uh, a sense it's a, it's one of those wounds that's cut a little deep in me just recently. So as we have come out of COVID, we have been inundated with my local family search center isn't open, right? Or the posted hours that they have, don't you know, and I can't get a hold of somebody. And so I've actually, I didn't talk about it today because it's, uh, again, it's a little bit of a sore point. So uh, to answer your question, the first, the very first point is, make sure you call or connect with somebody before you spend 20 minutes driving there. And 20 minutes is actually short compared to some people that, that spend an hour or two trying to get to one. Uh, Cause the last thing I want you to do is get there and, and find that it's locked. Okay. Uh, to the, it, it, they are little, uh, we, we call them, you can refer to them as branches or satellites of the mothership. Not that we're aliens, but Kind of makes me feel like one. Um, it's a good analogy, right? So there are extensions of us. In the past, when uh, pre-digital, that's where we would send microfilms, right? You'd ask for a microfilm and you could view the microfilm. Now, uh, those centers, uh, as our extensions, will allow you to view uh, more of the digital images than you would be able to view at home. So uh, it's somewhere around 300 million additional images that you'll be able to access if you go to a family search center. In addition, you will have access to uh, family uh, ancestry library edition, my heritage, my heritage library edition, and also find my past and any of the newspaper um, subscription sites that <laughs> that I've paid for. <laughs> it's uh, and I I'm gonna. I, I'll get it wrong, right? But I believe it's newspaperarchive.com is the one that we have for all centers uh, in the in the United States. Um, it was uh, better coverage uh, that compared to the other offerings that we had. Um, so I'm going to share another little secret with you, um, and it might save you 20 minutes, and it might be in the same place. So if you go to any one of our our local meeting houses. Um, people might look at you a little weird. Um, and if you drop my name, they'll even look at you even more 
like you're more of a weirdo, right? Because they won't know who I am. <laughs> but if you go to any one of our meeting houses and log in, you have to download a, 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 a Chrome browser extension. It's um, I I will send it to Janice and she can send it to everybody. But if you download the Chrome extension and then go to one of our meeting houses and connect to the Liahona Wi-Fi, uh, which is a quick Google search away to find the password, you can actually access all of the records as as if you were at a family search center, whether that building has a family search center or not. Uh, so some people, if it's nice weather, of course, right? If it's 150 degrees outside, no one wants to do it. But um, sit under the shade of a tree, uh, take your laptop, connect to the Wi-Fi there in the local meeting house. And if you're, it's as if you are in the family search center uh, there in your neighborhood or 20 minutes down the road. So if you do have one of those building, you know, a, a meeting house, uh, it's five minutes away compared to a family search center. It's 20 minutes away. Go try this first. That's, you know, uh, and download the Chrome browser and uh, act, you'll be able to access all those restricted images that are restricted to family search centers. Thank you. That was kind. I will share it. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, we, we haven't publicized that yet quite yet because we're not quite sure what the marketing message is around it. But um, we, we do have a, a help article all about that. It takes you actually step by step on what to do. <laughs> and how to do it so well sir we do want to thank you for for your time today and also if we could please if you would pass on a huge kudos to all of those who assisted during COVID, especially when we were able to do those online record requests and people would go and they say give us two weeks and we'll get it with, you know the document to you and they get it to us in two days I am infinitely grateful for those things because that was a wonderful, wonderful service when we couldn't actually go to these local places. So um, it has been an honor to have you with us, sir. This has been amazing. And I cannot wait till NSDOF comes out there with our little green on and you'll know we're there. We are in the house. Renee. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Let us know. Uh, let me know, Janice and, and Renee, when you're coming. Um, uh, I, and uh, we'll definitely make sure that uh, we welcome you with open arms and which we would anyway, but uh, since we have a connection and I want to make sure that it's a, a good visit for, for all of you. Um, Thank just, you. just real quickly. Um, I, we do have affiliate libraries as well, public libraries that act as a family search center. And if you have a public library that's close to you, close to you, they may not be aware of our affiliate library program. You can reach out, reach out to me. I can help them become an affiliate. That way, you again, you may may have an opportunity to get a little bit closer. Um, and um, those of you that are looking for questions uh, or uh, records pre eighteen ninety four, we have many, many millions of records that are predate our existence. So we have records from fifteen hundreds and some cases earlier, all the way to present. So. Lynn, we have a surprise to show you. I'm hoping.